Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and Module 4, Ecosystem Dynamics. In this video, we're going to have a little bit of a look at some of the reasons for change in ecosystems. Your learning intention is to be able to investigate the reasons for change in past ecosystems by interpreting a range of secondary sources to develop an understanding of the changes in biotic and abiotic factors over short and long periods of time. So things change. It's one of the um, most important things that we need to understand when we study the living world. There is change happening all around us all the time. And some of these changes are cyclic. They uh, occur in cycles and others, I guess we more concern not about whether or not things are changing, but the rates at which they change. And some of those changes have happened over very short time frames, and some of them over long time frames. Certainly in this particular section of this module, we've talked a little bit about extinction rates, both extinction of individual species like the Tasmanian tiger, for example, but also mass extinctions, extinctions that happen on a much larger scale, resulting in loss of biodiversity. And this can uh, occur for things like the megafauna, which occurred not only in Australia, but also in um, famously in parts of North America as well. Um, but even on a larger scale, again, if we go back to the age of dinosaurs, for example, and the Cretaceous tertiary boundary and some of the massive losses that we had then. And even then, that's not the biggest one. The biggest one is the Permian extinction. The hypothesized number of species or loss in biodiversity at, during the Permian extinction was massive, somewhere in the order of about 80, 85% of species uh, became extinct during that particular event. So we've had mass extinction events, we've had minor extinction events, and we currently, at the moment, have a number of species that are in danger or have become extinct in the past one to 200 years. So what are some of the reasons for that? Why do we have declines or changes in the abundance and distribution of native flora and fauna? And why are they so high when we see human settlement? So whenever humans settle in particular areas, they do seem to have an impact on the native species. Now, sometimes there's a level of um, readjustment, which allows um, a new kind of equilibrium to result and other times um, areas just can't recover or the changes that humans make are so great that there's no way, there's no time for populations to change in any meaningful way to be able to cope with the massive changes that have occurred either in uh, increases in their hunting, changes in their habitat, uh, clearing of land and so on. Some of the reasons why we see such a challenge for human settlements includes um, what we might call inappropriate land use and water use. Now, obviously they seem appropriate to us, but what they do is they disturb the balance. They change things around. And there's a lot of really interesting sorts of um, research that's being done into how we try and rewild, how we try and change things back uh, or, or try and undo some of the damage that we've done, particularly uh, in the area of water and also in land use. Habitat loss and fragmentation. Uh, this is a particular issue. Um, I, I guess it's most famously associated with the koalas in Port Stephens, uh, but the continued clearing of land, the corridors that are trying to be left for the koalas to continue to survive, but the fact that we have destroyed a lot of their habitat is really having an impact on their numbers and also their distribution. Uh, overpopulation of terrestrial and marine resources. One of the problems with a lot of agriculture is it becomes monoculture. And one of the problems that we have associated with monocultures is they are significantly reduce biodiversity. In fact, even things as simple as pests and weeds, which are going to be competing species or are going to be predators um, or, or herbivores, get wiped out. So we don't even allow much of an ecological um, system to develop in areas where we're really targeting specific species monocultures for agricultural use or for fisheries, for example. The spread of introduced herbivores, predators, weeds and disease, and these of course are significant. They include things like introduced species. And of course, there's been a whole range of different reasons why we've introduced species. We've introduced them for sport, we've introduced them for 
um, food, we've introduced them for work, and we've also introduced them as biological control agents to try and uh, address some of the concerns that we have around um, the increasing numbers. And some of those have been relatively successful, things like the prickly pear gets a bit of a tick for biological control, the cactoblastis um, caterpillars, the moth that has uh, that lays these little eggs, caterpillars, uh, the burrow into the prickly pear has been relatively successful in trying to at least regulate the numbers and the spread of prickly pears. But for example, the cane toads, well, they just get a big cross. They weren't even particularly successful at um, targeting the beetles that they were introduced to try and attack in the sugarcane crops, and they've just spread almost infinitely throughout our country. Um, they continue to expand their range. Their distribution continues to increase. Their abundance is massively increased to the numbers that were originally introduced, and we've not um, we can't look back on our record with cane toads as a successful introdu introduction of a biological control. So, um, and, and partly as a result of that, we now have a lot more checks and balances in place to try and find out what sorts of changes might be happening short term and long term. So as I said, one of the keys here is to look at the rate of change. And rate of change is just how quickly these changes are occurring. And we can identify as a very simple thing the um, human impact on the Australian environment, particularly since European settlement. And that has had an, a massive impact on um, the uh, delicate balance of ecosystems in Australia through extensive woodland uh, or forest clearing, changes in water regimes, uh, and as I mentioned, the introduction of particular plants and animals, some for sport, some for biological control, and some more successful than others. From a geological perspective, the past is the key to the present. And one of the reasons that we do spend time looking at the fossils, looking at past environments, studying rock types, and seeing if we can understand things like the um, significance of banded iron formations, is that because the past is the key to the present. And not only that, it's the key to what might be able to um, change for the future. So there's a lot of potential here for us to try and understand how humans can influence ecosystems and perhaps even to try and reverse some of the impacts that we have already had. Nevertheless, the study of past environments and extinction events allows us to get into the um, crystal ball gazing. Science is more than crystal ball gazing, of course. Science is about trying to identify patterns, identify cause and effect. Sometimes we're looking for correlations, which isn't necessarily causation. It doesn't necessarily mean we can pinpoint the exact causes, but we may be aware that certain activities, certain changes that we make in the environment can then have an impact that ripples through uh, the ecosystems and the whole biosphere. So one of the important things is that we need to actually understand current ecosystems. So this is one of the reasons why an awful lot of work is being done to study current ecosystems. Because the problem is if an oil spill occurs and a lot of uh, organisms get covered in oil, and perhaps a large number of them die, if we didn't understand the ecosystem before the oil spill, we've got no way of understanding exactly what the full impact of such a disaster may have been. So we need to try and get some patterns in terms of what do we have currently, what sort of things are changing, and how does our study of the past help us, help inform us about what sort of things we need to be doing in the present and then into the future. So we've already looked at and we've, we've debated things like the impact of human activity on things like the megafauna. We've said uh, things like fire critical or are they more likely to be related to climate and climate changes? Are there other factors? Is it a combination of factors? Is it the fact that all of these things happen to occur at a similar time? Are there parallels that we can draw between the Australian experience and say the North American experience or other areas of the world that lost uh, megafauna around about the same time, had human inhabitation at the same time, was there a similar time frame in terms of overlap, um, and were there other factors that might have also um, been contributing to a loss of the megafauna. In fact, um, megafauna was basically just big animals, and um, there's certainly been some devastating impacts on all sizes of animals, and so megafauna just a 
I guess, a, a small part of the actual ecosystems that existed. One of the things that we're wanting to try and do is to uh, learn about current rates of change, possible um, extinction events into the future, and um, the impact of human activity. And the best way to do that is by looking at the past. Uh, this is a nice little summary table. It comes out of the ATAR course notes. This is the ATAR course notes. It's another good resource if you want to look for resources, particularly those of you who are trying to do some summarising, some great stuff in there that I pull out from time to time. This is a nice little table because don't forget at the beginning of this video, we were looking at the difference between the um, short term and long term impacts of change in ecosystems. So here's two sitting side by side that give you an idea of the differences that we can see occurring when we start to look at change in past environments. So the first one of these is about the Permian-Triassic extinction event. And as I mentioned, this is a massive extinction event. This is the most significant one um, that we've seen. Uh, the most severe extinction event in the history of life on Earth. That's the big thing about the Permian uh, Triassic extinctions. 95% of marine species, 70% of land species, a big proportion of the known species at that time did not make it into uh, any of the rocks in, uh, in more recent times. So we know that well, our assumption is that they just didn't survive, that there's no record of them uh, after that particular time. One of the theories about how this particular extinction occurred is uh, related to marine microbial life. It's changes that occurred as a result of gene transfers, which changed the way that uh, these particular organisms were uh, interacting with material in the sea. And so that could potentially have been one of the reasons why we saw such a change on ecosystems at the time. We know that there are a couple of ideas that may have contributed to this, um, possibly an abiotic factor, meteorite impact, something from um, space coming into our atmosphere and colliding with the earth, that's an abiotic factor. Um, volcanic eruptions are often a um, contributor to change that occurs in ecosystems, partly because um, large amounts of material that can be eject ejected from a volcano can end up in the atmosphere. This can interfere with solar radiation. Uh, there's also poisonous gases that can be released by volcanoes as well, which can also have an impact on living things. But a change in methanogens, we're now talking about a biotic Factor. Contrast the Permian-Triassic extinction to the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef. So this is a recent event. This is a much smaller scale, no less devastating in terms of what could happen to the biodiversity of the coral reefs. But again, some things that we can look at. And this one links into our understanding of climate change. Climate change is, or climate science I'll call it, and it's a very broad area and it's also very emotive, not something that I'll deal with now, but we will later. And some of what we've understood from climate science has come from a huge amount of data that's identifying um, changes in the rates uh, at which cycles are occurring in the past. So we've seen ice house events and greenhouse events occurring in the past, but we're seeing rates that have never existed in the past. And this is having a lot of impacts, changes in sea water temperatures, which again is an abiotic factor, changes in acidity, acidification I'll call it, of the seawaters. That change is also happening and it too is an abiotic factor. Um, rates of fishing, which is a biotic factor, we're doing the fishing and the uh, fish are actually, uh, the fish populations if you like, are changing and so that has an impact on the food webs or individual food chains. Increased sedimentation from runoff, which is also something that's happened as a result of human activity, can also be regarded as a biotic factor. So remember, we needed to link in our abiotic and biotic factors to short and long-term changes as we're studying past environments, as we're looking back in time. One of the things that's really important when we understand, uh, in order to try and understand what's happening in things like the Great Barrier Reef, is the symbiotic mutualistic relationship between corals and Zooxanthellae. And these are particular types of algae that can live in the coral that can photosynthesize because they're plants and and therefore can generate some energy for or, or foods, those sorts of organic materials that can be good for the 
uh, corals, the corals to provide some protection. So there's benefit to both organisms in this particular type of interaction. The bottom line though is that if the temperature changes, if levels of acidity change, if there's other things that are occurring that make it less likely for the algae to survive, then they will no longer form these partnerships and the result is that the corals will starve. So the energy that's being produced, that's supplementing the, the corals' needs is now not there. And as a result of that, we um, find that the corals will actually start to die. And this is, um, this is the bleaching that we see happening in various parts of the Great Barrier Reef. This is something that we can link more strongly to human activity, and therefore it is something that we can perhaps do something more specifically about trying to address and perhaps even reverse in order to try and recover some of the damage that's been done. When we study past ecosystems, some of the things that we study have happened long times ago and we can't do anything about them. What we can do is learn from them. We can see if there are lessons that we can take from the past in order to apply them to the present and perhaps to improve the future. Thanks for watching.